Okay, joining us now is the fan favorite, Barton, who's going to talk to us about all things that we've been dying to ask him, which is what's going on in repo land? What is this QE? Is this, what is this doing to the market? Barton, it's a pleasure having you. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Kevin. Uh, thank you for having me back. So uh, let's just get to it. What do you think's happening? What's going on in the market? I, I know your your fans are dying to know. Yeah, so there have been this very massive rally in the past uh, four or five weeks, and that coincides with the uh, Fed T-bill purchase that was announced on October 14th. So there has been a lot of chatter about whether uh, Fed has started a new QE program and uh, is that behind the massive uh, market rally? So uh, it is a great opportunity here to take a closer look again at what's happening to Fed's balance sheets and what's happening to the to funding market. So if, if we just go to the previous slide for one second, uh, I actually did a correlation between what's happening to the bank reserve that's on uh, New York Fed's computer, uh, where all the QTQE is actually um, adding or subtracting money into that account and in comparison to the spx one day return which is the blue bars you can see in the uh, inset on the lower right side of the of the screen and you can see after october 18th when spx dealers gamma exposure went positive for the first time after that uh, mini sell-off in october uh, we did have a quite good correlation between what Fed and Treasury has been doing versus what SPX has been doing. Pretty much every uh, rally or, uh, I would say, sometimes it's not really a big rally, just the, the gradual grind up in, in SPX levels basically follows a injection of liquidity from either the Fed or Treasury or from the the GSE, meaning Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Yeah, so Barton, I, I noticed this many years ago when the we first saw the uh, advent of the QE. Um, I guess it was QE1 when I noticed all of a sudden the market used to get strangely strong on some days and, and I could never figure it out. It was like it always came in at 10.45 or 11. And I thought to myself, why is this? Market looks like it should be rolling over until one time I realized that uh, it coincided with the QE days. And I did exactly what you did. I started to track the days that the Fed was in there buying and expanding their balance sheet. And I, and I came to the same conclusion that although people will tell me that there should be no correlation, in the real world, there is a correlation. And I don't care why or, or what's causing it, and maybe it shouldn't be that way, but if there's, if there's something there that can make money, I was like, I'm going to go with it. And at the very least, I'm not going to fight it. I'm not going to be shorting on days when the Fed's adding lots of... Uh, liquidity. And so I think it's terrific that you showing that this is, it's yeah. back in play. We're back to the point where uh, QE matters or not QE, at least liquidity matters. And it's, it's driving the day-to-day -day movement of the stocks. Exactly. I have to say that uh, I think your uh, blog article on, on the QE uh, infusion causing market rally five years ago, maybe six years ago, was the article that picked my interest in, in tracking these as well. Uh, oh, without that article, I wouldn't have track the QT and QE and all of these. We have we have uh, we have the two fanboys of each other here. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. All right, so uh, so uh, so what's going on here on the on the next page that we're we're kind of looking at these slides here in terms of bank reserves and so on. What's uh, what's uh, what's this showing us? Yeah, so I like to take one step back and looking and look at the big picture. This is this is a slide from uh, New York Fed. And what they were being sh they're showing here is what's happening, what has been happening to Fed's balance sheet in the past few years and in the future. And they were being so the QE that has happened uh, for the last decade was the first panel where the uh, when they when Fed bought uh, Treasury as well as mortgage-backed security, and at the same time, mostly the bank reserve increase. And last year we had QT, which is the inverse of that. Uh, Fed retired, maturing um, mortgage-backed security as well as treasury, and the bank reserve shrunk accordingly. So in September, we kind of reached this steady state where the total balance sheet size is a constant. Uh, the 
uh, bank reserve shrunk to sort of the minimum level. And uh, because there's another part of, of uh, money on the Fed's uh, liability side, which is the Treasury general account. That part used to be pretty small, but in September it grew tremendously. It grew by about 170 billion uh, over the course of uh, three weeks, which pushed the bank reserve below the kind of a minimum acceptable level for banks to intermediate in the repo market and cost the uh, repo crisis. The, the, the overnight repo rate went up up to 10%. On the average, it's still like 5.5%, but in some cases, 10%. So the Fed did the emergency measure to offset that uh, acute sort of depletion of bank reserve. Uh, rather than doing what they thought they would do for under number four on the right-hand side of this slide, they went back to something uh, sort of akin to uh, what they did uh, five, six years ago, uh, like QE, they were increasing their their treasury and uh, MBS uh, holding. But this is a, a quite a little bit different from what they did before. So that's uh, why we need to take a closer look at it. So if we go to the next slide. All right, here we go. Yeah, so the first thing they did is they started this uh, overnight repo and term repo program. If you look on the right left hand side of the slide, that is the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet. This overnight term repo, the green uh, piece of the pie, is uh, a, it didn't actually exist before the September repo crisis. So as you can see on the right hand side, that is a time evolution of the repo balance versus the treasury general account balance versus the bank reserve. Uh, I, I shifted the bank reserve number by uh, $1,400 billion so, they, so that they can fit on the same y-axis. So that's all relative <laughs> values. Right, right. And what you can see is there was there is a, a there was an acute depletion of bank reserve in, in September, and Fed immediately started to inject repo liquidity uh, to offset that increase in TGA, and the repo pretty much follows the TGA trajectory ever since. And everything Fed did afterwards, uh, this uh, T bill purchase, uh, or I like to call it a, a POMO program, permanent open market operation program is uh, something on top of repo and is, try, uh, is a more of a long-term solution to this uh, short-term fix using the, using the uh, repo facility that, uh, that New York Fed has. Right. Um, Barton, I am just good to Kev here. Why do people get so upset when you call that POMO QE? I, I've noticed a lot of fights on Twitter where people start discussing, is it QE, is it not QE? Um, to me, I guess the only difference between that POMO and QE is the fact that QE went out the curve, but they're both basically purchases of assets in the open market that, uh, that the Fed is doing. And in fact, even the QE was described as POMO back in the day. I remember when I used to look up the schedule, that's where I found it under the Fed's POMO uh, kind of uh, tab. Exactly. That's a very good question. So if you go to the next slide... I would uh, I would say that the the Fed QE program, the official the official QE program, they call it a, a large scale asset purchase. Um, I joke it. Uh, I, I I'm jokingly call it as a large scale Apple purchase program because it kind of boosts Apple stock quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is part of the operation under the Pomo umbrella. If you look at the upper right hand side. Um, but they 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 did uh, mostly on the line of the curve, as you said. So in terms of duration, in terms of how much uh, how much liquidity is injected to the pot of money that is uh, earmarked or saved for long duration, more risk taking uh, partial portion of the investment capital, that's more risk on than the TBO purchase that's on the front end. So uh, if we go to the next slide, I have a chart that shows what is what's the Fed balance sheet has been 
looking like in the past uh, five years. So what you're seeing here is the composition of the treasury holding of, on the uh, Fed's balance sheet. And you can see that uh, from the bottom to the top is from the short duration three year treasury all the way to 10 to 30 year treasuries. And you can see that um, most of the QT program ha that happened in 2000, uh, 2018 was just retiring the uh, treasury notes that is scheduled to retire. And they, they had a duration of uh, uh, six months to one year left uh, on, their, on their book. So what's, what's been shrinking is really just that the dark blue uh, portion at the bottom of these bars. And what is happening right now is as opposed to uh, adding long duration T notes, Fed is adding very short duration, three to eight months T bills, uh, sort of underneath this blue bar, it's shorter than most of the T notes they're holding. And I would argue that the effect of the POMO program currently ongoing is similar to the reverse of the QT we have last year. Right, and, and I, I guess I would argue that if you're expecting them to roll the T-bills, then it doesn't matter if they do this POMO or if they do QE out the curve. It, in essence, ends up being the same thing, which is a Fed expansion of the balance sheet. Right. Yeah. That's, so that, that that is true because they are rolling pretty much the the segment of the curve that's almost close to expiration. Right. Well, anyways, I'll let you continue with your presentation here. So, but I would argue that this is less risk on than the uh, operation twist, which they explicitly uh, sold T bill and bought very long duration uh, treasury at right. the time. So yeah, I'm not sure. Barton, you know what? We're going to have to save that for the bar someday because I think I might take the other side of that trade. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's go, go continue with this and let's talk about the next slide and what this might mean for the market. Yeah, so if we go on to the next slide. Um, the, the market impact of, uh, of these uh, liquidity injections, in my view, also has to be considered together with how uh, the short-term interest rate market has been behaving. So what I'm showing here is a chart that compares the 90-day uh, commercial financial commercial papers uh, as opposed to the, the that's the blue curve as opposed to the uh, effective Fed fund rate. And that kind of, so the spread between the two, the distance between the two, and also the overall slope of the uh, short-term rate on the uh, funding market kind of give you a sense of whether the market is doing tightening or easing by itself. So you can see here if the, so there were a couple of periods when there was a acute tightening happening. Uh, there was one between February and April last year. There was also a pretty significant one in Q4 last year. And then after that, we enter into this easing mode uh, starting on January and again between June and now. So that was two period of acute uh, easing just by the funding market itself. Right. And if we have a balance expansion during this easing episode, that's adding fuel to the fire and you, you're you more likely to see a, a risk on rally. And when you have this tightening with a, a liquidity withdrawal, that's the time when you see significant weakness, weakness in the equity market. Okay, and so what's the schedule for going forward? What does it look like? So what is gonna happen is quite interesting. Where there's still quite a lot of room for easing. As you can see, the blue curve hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, caught up with the purple um, effective Fed fund rate yet. And there's quite a, dis quite a bit of distance to go. And by the way, you can see here, Fed is kind of behind the curve. It's always just doing what the market told it to do, as opposed to uh, proactively raising or, or easing the, lowering the interest rate. 
So if we go on to the next slide, that is what I see, uh, what the liquidity situation would be for the next uh, six weeks all the way into the end of the year. It's quite interesting. We're probably going to see uh, quite a bit of uh, liquidity injection on the order of $110 billion before the middle of December. This is a big chunk of easing or liquidity injection from the Fed in preparation for a big tax day on December 16th. Uh, that day alone, I think Treasury, together with GSE, will take away a, about $105 billion on that day. So if they didn't do anything, that would have been another September 17th repo crisis. Right. So this is basically the Fed uh, kind of juicing the liquidity of the, of the economy or the market ahead of that tax day because they're worried about a repeat of the last tax day, which was kind of the start of the repo gate, right? That's right. And they're just uh, injecting money into the money market, market right? So uh, overnight through uh, 12 months, short-term funding market. Whether the, those money will go to hedge fund, uh, increasing their leverage, or uh, reducing the spread in derivatives, derivative market and future market depends on whether primary dealer has the balance sheet capacity or they, are, they want to take the risk to allow hedge funds to post their equity or uh, treasury as collateral to borrow more money. Fair enough. And so for those that are listening and can't see this, Barton's basically created a graph that shows the liquidity uh, forecast for the next couple of months or a month and a half. And what it shows is that it goes flat until the beginning of December. And then from December 1st all the way to December 14th, there's a huge spike. And that's the liquidity injection that the Fed is, and the Treasury and the GSEs are expected to do. And then there's a huge drop off as we get that tax payment day and the, and the liquidity comes out of the system and it goes back to even. And then again, we have a little bit more injection going into year end. And this kind of poses a good question for you, uh, Barton. What do you expect at year end? Because some of the participants are very concerned that there is going to be a lot of demand for liquidity at the turn, as they call it, and that the Fed, after kind of dropping the ball so badly this last uh, Last month, they're not up to the task, and you might find a situation where they actually um, aren't providing enough liquidity. What do you see going into your end? Yeah, that's a very good point. So the repo market itself is actually not a single market. There are several different segments. What Fed is participating is the tri-party repo. And because of so much liquidity is injected into that part of the market, you should see very little, uh, if any, spikes or rate increase in, for that part of the market. But so you expect you you expect a, a not a repeat. So you're in the camp that the Fed's on top of it, and we're not going to have uh, problems at the turn for the repo market. But that's just for the tri-party market, uh, repo okay. market. That's just between the right. primary dealer with the Fed and then the, a couple of other guys. The 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 repo market that hedge funds. Uh, uses is the FICC uh, repos. Those oh, okay. are very Fair different. Enough, yeah. Those are netable. The tri-party is not netable. Netable basically means that if it's if I take an option analogy, you open a uh, if you open a put spread, uh, a, a credit put spread, your long leg of the put spread kind of reduces the margin requirement from the short leg of the put spread, right? right? But uh, so that's the idea of netting. For the tri-party repo market, it's not netable, meaning a primary dealer, when they conduct a transaction, either they're shorting or they're long a US treasury, it's all going to cause their balance sheet. It's not going to be netted. And is wow. this and this is the problem that we basically are are experiencing is that there's different segments of the market and the liquidity is not nettable between these different segments and at different points of the market 
uh, there's a demand for that particular kind of liquidity in that section. And so you get spikes in one and it just, there's no arbitrage between the two. Is that correct? Right, there's a transmission or a intermediation issue between the two markets. And it's the, it's the issue of uh, a prime dealer still having too much T notes and T bonds on their, on their book. So, uh, Barton, I, I wanted to ask you, like, so we had this uh, little spike here in the middle of December and then obviously the, the drop off from the tax event. Uh, is this, uh, in your mind, an analog for uh, what could happen on these stock markets? Is, uh, do you feel that uh, this is, uh, is going to impact the way the equity markets are going to play out through December? I don't think so, unless there is a very uh, big catalyst, like uh, if the U.S.-China trade deal fell apart, or there's some other acute geopolitical issue that causing the the equity market to go into a deep negative gamma region on the, on the auction dealers' uh, gamma exposure yeah. curve. And that's, uh, without that's is that on your model still like under three thousand, or is that where what what level is that gamma flip uh, occur? Yeah, it's uh, it's below three thousand. The the December expiration monthlies, that's it's just a crazy bank of calls like all the way yeah. from three thousand to three thousand three hundred. It's a it's an amazing amount of calls over there. So it's a pretty bulletproof uh, positive gamma band, I would say. Wow. Okay, so Barton, back to your end. You said that the the try the the kind of government or the one that the Fed's in charge of, there should be no issues. But are you worried about the one that the hedge funds, the repo market where the hedge funds conduct their business? Do you worry about uh, spikes in there? Yeah, they, they could be probably maybe up to uh, 4%, 5%. We're not going to see um, 10% kind of uh, repo rates for the year end. Because this year end is very similar to the year end of last year. Right, right. No, but the year end of last year was really ugly, right? We had a big, huge risk off move, and it was uh, there. I, I realized it was a different scenario because we had uh, Powell telling us that uh, we're a long way from neutral, and now he's still almost doing the other, the opposite. We're rolling over and saying whatever the market wants. But from a liquidity point of view, if, if it looks like the year end of last year, wouldn't you argue that that would mean that we could have a risk off move going into the year end? The, the, that's a good question. The, uh, the, the risk off last year really came from that December 15th. The last year was December 17th, the, the tax day. And they took out 100, uh, sorry, $98 billion between that tax date all the way into Christmas Eve. We don't mm -hmm. have that this year. Um, and also in my, in my curve on the previous slides, I did not consider how much liquidity primary dealer could take from the provision that's unused for the from the repo program, the Fed repo. There's still fifty billion unused. Oh, I so, see. The Fed still yeah, still has more. Not only that, they can uh, they can up that really quickly, right? There's nothing yeah. stopping them. Whereas yeah. before last year, they didn't really understand what was going on. You're all, like, would you say that they have a, a better understanding of what the liquidity needs of the market are, and therefore are less likely to see a situation where the liquidity gets squeezed into your end? Yeah, that's fair. And also, right. the uh, hedge funds and other parties are not necessarily uh, heavy users of repo on like December 31st and December 30th, it's the, mostly the, you know, the banks and money market fund, those, those are heavier users. Right. Right. So, so how much, uh, so how much uh, treasury uh, bill we are going to see Fed purchase in the months to come? And that is a question that uh, many people ask and because they were wondering whether we're going to see a risk on move in equity market for much longer, not just for the last uh, four or five weeks, but also maybe for two, three months. Um, the manager of the SOMA desk at New York Fed had a interview about a week ago in which she said uh, that they were comfortable in bringing the T-bill uh, their ownership of T-bill to about 15% of the total outstanding T-bill in the market, which is about 
360 billion to 480 billion um, dollars. They literally had no T bill on their book before. So if they keep wow. doing the 60 billion per month purchase, that would take another four to five months for them to hit that target. And I, I believe their main goal is to reduce the current repo balance to as close to zero as possible so they can use that as a contingency uh, measure on days or on uh, weeks when you have this end of quarter, end of the year window dressing need or or uh, other market dislocation, just but very short term dislocations that they can put a bandaid on those as opposed to have this ongoing large balance of repo. Right. So they're basically going to do a permanent purchase of the bills. They're going to keep rolling them until they get a situation where there's no more demand for the repo. Right. Right. Although right. the Pomo operation is a bit more stronger than the repo, quite a bit stronger because f for the T-bill purchase, in terms of the cost on the primary dealers and the banks, there's zero cost for them. They're just sitting there getting their IOER for the for this money fed injected into a system. For repos, they do have to pay 1.55% interest rate on those liquidity. So there is a quite a bit of difference in the calculation how, band, how banks and primary dealers will deploy those capital. And I do think there still is quite a bit of room for a risk on move. Right. And so now the next question for you, Barton, does this all this liquidity that the Fed is injecting, does it result in a lower U.S. dollar, you think? I think so. There is a, there is a quite a bit of scrambling into a bit of formaling into U.S. equities in the past uh, four or five weeks that kind of elevated the U.S. dollar. But uh, the foreign banks, as far as I have seen through their action in the past 18 months, are pretty good at grabbing bank reserve from U.S. banks. Um, and once they do that, it's uh, there's this, you know, there's no there is no uh, shortage of U.S. dollar uh, as long as uh, foreign banks are willing to arbitrage that. This is much, much cheaper than the, uh, the swap lines that Fed has with ECB. Back in the summer, I think uh, the Fed charged about 2.5%, 2.6% APR on the uh, dollars they lent to, to Swiss National Bank and, as well as ECB for like seven days for those term right. swap lines. So that's a lot more expensive than just uh, taking the POMO money and then grab the reserve from, from the US banks. So pardon, another question I have for you is I've heard people tell me that uh, Mnuchin is uh, a, a wizard that understands how to use the TGA account, which is a treasury general account to influence markets <laughs> and how they're all over it. And I'm kind of, I'm a, I must say, I'm a seller of the idea that Mnuchin is a wizard and understands what, <laughs> what, what, what he's doing. I kind of almost think that the most market participants underestimate the effects that all of their kind of shenanigans with the TGA and even with the liquidity of the Fed uh, have on the markets and the economy. What do you feel? Well, that's a million dollar. That's a billion dollar question, really, because uh, Mnuchin has done a lot of surprising uh, maneuvers. In the past three weeks, I was am very surprised about how Treasury has been hoarding cash. I would have thought they've been uh, cutting their TBO assurance, uh, reducing their uh, TGA balance. But no, I've seen TGA shooting up all the way to $430 billion on uh, um, December 16th. So I see a lot of hoarding tendency for Treasury right now. and. Uh, you know, there is no legal requirement for them to hold so much cash, and uh, they can release those anytime they want next year. So and do it, you think he's it, doing that on purpose? Like, do you think he's he's uh, getting that ready for the, you know, release the hounds later? Or do you think he just doesn't know what he's doing? I think uh, I think this is all done strategically. There is no reason for them to hoard, like, this much uh, TGA balance uh, because they, they have to pay interest on those balance. And uh, and uh, this is we're at a historic high level. This is like a 99 percentile level of TGA balance, and we don't have a debt ceiling coming up 
next early next year. Right now, I see uh, some people also think that there is um, some other mastermind behind this uh, repo squeeze that we saw. That Diamond, Jamie Diamond, was the guy <laughs> doing it. What do you think about that? I, I don't think so. I think I think their their hands are tied uh, because of the Basel three, and also the Fed regulations on how bank operates. I think Dime, Jamie Diamond would love to arbitrage on those uh, on this ten uh, percent repo rates if they could. I completely agree. The idea that they're sitting around and they're not uh, hitting those bids when they when they see it, uh, when people are demanding liquidity, they would step in there and do it, especially at ten percent. Um, so, what's your kind of summing it up? What do you think is the opportunities going forward here for the for the next month or two? Well, I think there uh, could be if there's a sustained risk on move, uh, the market probably will be getting very long, and uh, the uh CTAs, the the risk controlled funds, everybody's uh leveraged up to the seam. So I I think we probably could see a a correction that uh, is on par with Feb- February two thousand eighteen, somewhere in Q one two thousand twenty. Wow, that's uh that's uh so and you and you think that that will correspond with a pretty substantial spike in volatility then at the same time, right? Well, I'm yeah, I think it would, there will be a pretty big spike in volatility uh, and all of these hinges on how quickly credit market will deteriorate because uh, so what Fed has been doing in terms of POMO doesn't solve the issue of the uh treasury crowding out the uh, corporate bonds, um, primary dealer, and banks balance sheets. So as the Treasury continue to issue this much $300 billion a quarter new T-bills and T-bonds, at some point, this is going to break. This is, we're already seeing the precursor of that CCC um, high yield spread has been widening nonstop right, for the past couple of months. And we're going to see that probably gradually go into B and BB grade high yield. Um, at some point, this is going to cause credit market to really seize up and uh, could potentially cause equity market to deteriorate so, as well. So, you know, I, I saw that headline uh, that um, uh, Ray Dalio uh, they were putting on this huge uh, a March uh, options position, betting on a, a downdraft in the stock okay. market. By yeah, I have to interrupt here because Ray Dalio actually said that when he spoke to the reporter, whoever spoke to the reporter, they said that it was nothing more than a hedge and that they were still OK. Wrong. So they're still hedging. Yeah. Uh, which is they see they see, they see some stormy waters ahead, right? They're, okay, well, they're not betting on the downside. They're not trying yeah. to profit. They're they're taking risk off. But uh, but you you think that uh, Ray Dalio is seeing the same thing there? Is well, is wait, that... maybe it wasn't Ray Dalio's account that was buying those seventy five thousand <laughs> options. Maybe it was Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's all my evil twin. <laughs> That's right. Well, Barton, thank you so much for joining so, us today. And uh, why don't you tell few, people? Oh, so, sorry. Go few, ahead. Few, I have a few words on on the on the Dario, uh, the the Wall Street Journal. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, but let's let's I yeah, didn't sure. mean to cut you off. Sorry. Go ahead, Barton. So that's an interesting thing. They've done that throughout August uh, as well. So Dario, I believe they have this uh, hedging thing going out like all the time. They bought a tons of December and March puts uh, throughout August, uh, and then they gradually rolled them, those into uh, March and June right now. Um, it's just a regular hedging like program. A hedge program. They, yeah, okay. I think they, they, there's, they do uh, their risk parity uh, fund. They need to level up when the realized vol is low, right? And when you level up, you also buy a little bit of hedge to. Just in case, and also yeah. since the vol is low, why not? Right. So I, you're I, basically I, saying that, 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 that as the volatility on the equity has gone down, that means they should theoretically be longer, so levering up, and then they basically protect themselves on the downside, especially since vol is low. They buy the protection. Right, and then they do that all the time. Because, Genius. Uh, because their size are so large, everybody sees that. Like even yeah. I noticed that. So that's that means 
many, many more people have been seeing that for years. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Anyways, Barton, thank you for joining us. Why don't you tell people where they can find you? The Barton is a must must follow on Twitter. Make sure you go and you uh, you follow him. I'll let you tell uh, tell people where they can find you. Yeah, for people who are interested in uh, following how Fed, Treasury, and uh, GSEs are doing in terms of market liquidity, as well as some of the uh, option market uh, skew uh, evolution over time, I can you can just follow me on Twitter with uh, this handle at Barton underscore options. Uh, again, thanks, Kevin and uh, Patrick, for having me on the show. It's a lot of fun. It was a pleasure having oh, you. It's yeah. great to it's uh, it's great to have the the quant guys to talk to. I love I love chatting with you, Barton. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Likewise. Bart. All right. Take care. Have a great Take one. Care. Cheers.